Hi there, everyone. It's Christy, and I am really excited today to be joined by a very special guest, someone that I know many of you have missed and asked about. And I was really pleased and honored that he reached out and asked if he could come on a hangout. Uh, and that guest is Professor, a good friend of mine, uh, Professor Moriarty, someone that um, we all love listening to. And that's mostly what I'm hoping that you're going to do in this hangout as an audience member. I know I'm going to try to do it as the interviewer. I'm going to try to shut up and let Philip talk as much as he wants. That's so a bad first, idea. <laughs> so hello, welcome back to Google uh, Hangouts. Hello, Christy. Real pleasure to be here. Thanks for those those very kind words. Um, as you know, the professor really isn't, um, the professor's salutation really isn't necessary. Philip is obviously more than fine enough, um, been called much worse than that. Um, <laughs> well, this is the thing. I don't have many friends in my life that I can call professors, so I'm going to bust that out whenever I can. Doctors, I know quite a lot of doctors who are friends of mine, but only my friends are only starting to become professors now, so it's cool. Good, so, good. yeah, now I have to I have a confession. You and I talked about the content of this, and we originally were going to record this tomorrow. And like a naughty student, I haven't done all the reading because we bumped up the time recording. So that means even more, you're going to have to um, do most of the talking. But if there's anything that you refer to that you've provided to me, I can certainly put those links in the description box if people want to go ahead and, and read further. Will do, Chrissy. That, that, that's great. First of all, I should point out stress. You can see in the background that this is a rather more um, nondescript uh, environment and background than previously. I've got to stress that this um, Hangout is very much in a personal capacity. Um, it's interesting how some people get rather offended when you critique certain other people online. And um, as I said to Dr. Mason, who I'll speak about in a second, um, there's a none too subtle irony here in terms of uh, just why I have to stress that these are my personal views and in no way connected with those of my employers. Um, so I, I, it would be good if we could speak in generalities. I, I, this is going to be a one-off. Yeah. Do you want to talk know, a little bit about what you want to do the what you want to do in the hangout and talk about, and yeah. then just start start going. Will do. Um, so there are a few things. Um, first of all, as many know, I took my YouTube channel down. I also took my blog down. They won't be coming back. Um, there are a number of different reasons for these. I've not made a public statement about why the YouTube channel went. A public statement may be forthcoming in the future. At the moment, it remains to be seen whether it's a public statement is going to be made. Um, I would say it's interesting. I was, I was counting it up. I would say that over the course of the years, um, I uh, had my, a personal YouTube channel because, of course, I contribute to other YouTube channels as well um, that are not mine. Um, and the blog and in terms of various other social media, I would say over the years I probably um, wrote half a million words, probably, um, of that order. That's like five books, six books. And mm -hmm. the issue here is for what? Maybe 10% of that was worthwhile. And the 10% that were worthwhile, I hope you know who you are, you know, on both sort of er side and the other side, if we're going to put it in terms of like that. Um, so it's one issue, one thing I want to get back to towards the end of this is in terms of engagement. And how much of that engagement is valuable and how much of that engagement is not valuable. And how much of that engagement is really just about in-group versus out-group dynamics and about fighting and bickering, etc and um, the dangers of that for both sides. Um, so I want to speak in generalities later on, but obviously Dr. Mason, Thunderfoot, made uh, a couple of videos uh, about me shortly after the YouTube channel went down. Now, I find this quite remarkable. Um, I don't want to turn this into more personal sl slagging matches or, or mudslinging. Did I behave in the most mature fashion always? No. Uh, did I lose my temper? Yes, I tend to lose my temper with regard to some of the behaviors online and some of the culture that's normalized by the way some of these larger YouTube um, characters behave. Temper, absolutely not. Um, but it was interesting that for nine months I waited. I wrote a critique of Mason. It was a fairly um, strong critique but I would say it was fairly above the board. I think the one place where he might um, argue that I was slightly unfair was that I pointed to a rational wiki article about him. 
I don't know. I think that Rational Wiki article is reasonably um, fair in, in some regards. I think there are sort of um, equal opportunities in terms of the people they critique. So, but I did find it remarkable that I waited for that response for nine months and nothing, tumbleweed, apart from back in September, there was a, he did a, a video with the remarkable title of I don't debate my enemies, I bury them which is hardly what you really want to hear from a scientist, but there you go. Um, and nothing, as I say, no, no real substantive response. And the moment my channel goes down, then suddenly he appears. That I found quite strange. And also, he seemed to think that the reason the channel went down um, was somehow related to him, which there's this continual theme of jumping rather excitably to, to different conclusions. So, you know, it could be his argument was that he was incredibly busy for those nine months and just didn't find the time to, to make a response. You know, and as we both know, Christy, there's correlation versus causation. And um, we can't say that that's directly that um, the fact that it was my channel went down was suddenly why he chose to respond. It may be just... Well, actually, if I could correct you, it went down for, I think, eight weeks, and then he learned about it, and then he made a response. So he, there was actually a lag because you went off air, and people talked about it, and it kind of moved on. And then when he learned about it, he was all surprised and created this narrative, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, that's okay. That's not quite what I um, imagined. I thought that, or uh, it's not quite how I understood it. I thought that he very quickly made a response. Is that not back in January? No. Well, I thought it was like several weeks after it happened. Like people had moved on to other drama, and then he okay. was like, "Hey, Moriarty's off the air," and he rage quit. And we're like, "No, um, where have you been for the last month?" So it was definitely a few weeks. Okay, yeah. So I, I, so it was before. I think the problem was that it was um, Christmas got in the way. So it was Christmas before and after. But it is interesting um, in terms of that time scale. You know, there was a long period of time where um, I asked him for a response. And you know, the important thing here is not so much the personal spat. It's it's related to the fact, and has always been related to the fact that um, Dr. Mason Thunderfoot made claims about the role of sexual dimorphism in underpinning pinning the gender balance in physics. And I asked for evidence for that. And despite all the bluster, and despite the, you know, the videos, there has still not been any evidence, any credible evidence, to show that sexual dimorphism, genetic and biological effects, contribute at whatever level to that gender balance. And um, it's rather like, if we can just focus on the science for a bit. So both um, Phil Mason and myself sort of work at the, the borderline between physics and chemistry, in terms of physical chemistry, chemical physics, whatever you want to call it. It's rather like, I was thinking in terms of analogies, in terms of a, a physical science is a STEM analogy, doing a, an optical absorption measurement where you've got some molecules, you've got some material, and you shine light through it and you look at the absorption spectrum. You look at how that light is absorbed. Getting that absorption spectrum and then just assuming that absorption spectrum tells you something realizing to the spectral response of the system without the molecules. The problem is here, we don't know the no we don't know the, the background, we don't know the what's called the transfer function. We don't know the underpinning um, effects of the environment on those uh, effects that we see in terms of the gender balance. The argument that I get frustrated about is that it seems to be suggested, no, it seems to be, it is suggested time and time again that my and your and others' argument is that actually we're saying the completely the opposite to um, Dr. Mason. We're saying completely the opposite, that everything is dominated by environmental effects. That's not the argument. That's never been the argument. The argument has been that where is the evidence which credibly normalizes out those environmental effects that shows convincingly that the gender balance has a sexual dimorphic component. 
And how would you do that? So I would be very, very happy. Um, and I suggested this all the way back a year ago. Um, I said to Dr. Mason, I would be very, very happy to um, have, let's have an exchange of views. Let's have an exchange of views in the peer reviewed literature. He's a big fan of the peer reviewed literature, as you know, Christy. Um, and let's, let's do it that way. Let's set out an exchange of views and because if you are fully committed to that position and it's about more than clickbait and it's about more than generating views for your channel and it's about more than the, the Patreon income you generate, if it really is the science you're interested in, then let's have an exchange of views in a scientific journal or in a scientific magazine. For example, the Institute of Physics just last week um, released a report on gender balance in physics. In that context, it would be great to have someone like yourself who argues that these are effects are hardwired and innate to actually debate that. So I don't know what your particular views on that, Christy, are, but um, that's certainly the way I'd like to see this progress. Well, as a quantitative and qualitative social scientist, I am led by the data. You know, and that's why sampling is important and understanding, you know, whether what the sample is, the people in the sample and the way the questions were administered and whether or not it can be generalized to a wider population in terms of the data. In qual, you have what people say and you, you aggregate that up into inductive processes to generate theories. So yeah, I'm entirely empirically led and I think anyone who makes an empirical claim has to be able to back it up. And if they can't back it up, then we just quote Christopher Hitchens. That which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. And pointing to Simon Baron Cohen's work, or pointing to work in terms of um, other primates preference for trucks is not addressing <laughs> the question is no. not addressing the question I it's remarkable how many times I get sent links to Simon Baron Cohen's papers as if I wasn't aware they existed I am <laughs> fully aware they exist that's not the argument the argument is in this particular context demonstrate provide some degree of evidence that that genetic, biological, sexually dimorphic component is affecting and influencing the gender balance. And if you can't do that, then your only expectation, your only um, uh, scientific position can be is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's, that's yeah, a scientific He's, he's making a go. causal claim. He's making a causal claim. He's claiming there's a causal mechanism that produces a specific observable outcome. And if that's the case, then he not only has to you know, have a, a causal mechanism that we can observe and test, but also to be able to explain change over time. We've seen rates of participation of women increase in the natural sciences. Precisely. So how does he account for that given his causal mechanism? And moreover, there are uh, geographical variations as well. So the, what's um, often pointed out is the skew in the balance when it comes to sort of mathematics performance. But in fact, you can find recent data that goes across a number of countries, and that skew can either be completely negligible or it can be to, to, tipped towards the male side, or indeed it can be tipped towards the female side. So making these claims on the basis of received wisdom is not the way to go. So I'll stress again, if Dr. Mason really is committed to this view, and I think it would be valuable, actually beyond valuable, <laughs> you don't mind the hyperbole there, to actually have an exchange in, in a journal or in a magazine like Physics World or Chemistry World or whatever, or I'm sure the Royal Society, I'm sure we could find some host for this, which would be an exchange of views in the peer-reviewed literature, which would get out there and help to inform this. Um, because... The way to do this is, is, is really to try and do it credibly and to try and do it in the context of a scientific discussion, a scientific debate. Having videos which have wrecked, destroyed, pwned, busted, etc., is, I would say, a rather tabloid way of doing science. It would be, you know, if, I, if I'm going to look for... Um, a particularly credible piece of work. I don't die for the piece of work that has busted or pwned in the in the in the title. Um, so this is not the way we do science. Obviously, you know we want to bring science to a wider audience. And to be fair to Dr. Mason, he's done that. He has done that, and he's done that pretty well. Um, and some of his science videos are great. 
And he knows that. I've told him that. And some of the science he and his collaborators do is extremely good science. And I've told him that. But just to back to this correlation versus causation thing. So nine months I wait, nothing happens. Then he appears. The very interesting thing is that shortly after that, there was this whole Lawrence Southern thing. Now, my politics and ideology do not, I've got to say, align entirely with Lauren Southerns. Um, I would say she's at the other end of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I would say that my politics and ideology are closer, indeed, in some ways, perhaps in many ways, to those of Dr. Mason. Yet, when Mason made his videos about Lauren Southern, he critiqued, and I think perhaps accurately critiqued, and she certainly said this herself, the fact that perhaps she'd overreached a little bit in terms of um, describing the all of the protesters as anti-Trump. But what really I found fascinating was that Mason went that further step in character assassination, which is, is what he tends to do. Um, and argued that really she was exaggerating in terms of the threat to her personal safety. Now, whatever you might say about Lauren Southern, and wherever you might stand on the political spectrum, she goes out into fairly charged situations and films videos, and you know, knowing full well that there are going to be people in that crowd that don't like her very much. And she does that. Now, whatever way you look at that, that takes some guts. And yet, what Phil Mason had to do was to actually push it that little bit further and try to dismiss her sort of personal integrity. And that's not, you know, that's not a particularly, how can I put it, credible way to actually address um, a point. He could have made his point very, very quickly, but he had to add that little bit of character assassination. And, you know, this is something that happens time and time again. I would agree. I think that the strongest arguments are the ones that speak from the evidence and to the evidence and really make it about what is the, what is the um, you know, factually correct thing or what can we infer from what we observe. To bring in personal slurs or character assassination really shows more about the speaker than the person they're speaking to because it's just a logical fallacy. They're poisoning yeah. the well and I, or they're out-homing. Yeah, and I, I'll well. admit I have perhaps from a certain perspective you could see that I could um, perhaps be... Um, similarly characterized in terms of my um, dealings with Mason. Did I behave in a somewhat childish fashion at times? I think I did. Um, but that's because a claim is made. And, you know, I wrote to him. I suggested we have um, a discussion about this. My very first point was to say, let's have an exchange of views. His very first point was, no, let's put it on my channel. That's well and good. I can understand why he might do that, because there's a lot of income to be generated that way. Um, the 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 issue then is um how can i best describe this the the the, the problem is that when you when you get a response which is head up your ass which is what i got um and i can understand perhaps why he did that because i referred to the um rational wiki entry on him but nonetheless it would have been helpful if at that point we could have had an exchange of views uh, that was a little bit more than I was just trolling you because clearly he didn't have time apparently then to engage properly but as soon as the channel goes on the line suddenly he then has time to um to critique similarly with southern so he made this video southern given the opportunity to have a face to face discussion and suddenly it became imperative to get back to incinerating gummy bears, which, you know, I'm not saying incinerating gummy bears isn't a good thing to do. <laughs> Again, in terms of making science um, more um, palatable, and um, it's a really good thing to do. It's a neat way. But suddenly, you know, she offers, uh, um, let's have a face-to-face -face discussion about this so we can clear up some of these misrepresentations. And suddenly Phil's approach is, no, too busy, got to get back to science. So this is what I mean about correlation versus causation. 
we as scientists, what we look for are correlations, we look for patterns. And when you see the same pattern repeating time and time again, it's intriguing to put it mildly. Similarly with, with the exchange you had with you, Christy, um, on the sexual dimorphism thing in a different context, which was related to um, sort of uh, women in leadership positions, rather similar type of pattern. And um, that's in terms of uh, just how we should behave as scientists. I have my feelings, and I should, as I say, I shouldn't have lost my temper. But it's a real shame because he is such, you know, it's clear, and I know from the emails I've received, that he's held in rather high regard by some people out there. Um, and it would be, it's a shame that he doesn't use that and say, look, this is the way we do science, even if he thinks I'm behaving like a dickhead, the, <laughs> the, it would be much better to present his evidence. And throughout all of this, he hasn't presented that evidence. And, okay, one time, if you, you said you were going to let me talk. You really shouldn't have done that, Chris. Please, please <laughs> feel free to put in. I will. In, I, will I, I know. Would, I'm just enjoying the, the, the listening, so it's fine. Go ahead. I would bore the hind legs and front legs and all appendages of a donkey. So, um, well, I know when I was on with Eli Bosnick and I, you know, told him basically the same thing. He's like, don't say that. I'm just going to keep talking. I'm like, keep talking. That's fine. That's why I have you on. I don't have, okay. I don't have you on so I can talk. Okay. So there is the, the, the jumping to conclusions aspect as well. Of course, you know, the jumping to conclusions um, about you know, my channel, the jumping to conclusions about sexual dimorphism. The interesting thing was the jumping to conclusions about um, the uh, the DMCA on his video. He immediately, without any evidence at all, said, well, that's Southern's fault. She's pulled the video. And I don't think there was any evidence at all to suggest that. In fact, she provided counter evidence. Similarly, does a telling there's a telling interaction, a very telling interaction. It's, I'm sort of getting more into the psychology and the sociology of this now, but it's, it, it is interesting to, to, to watch. Um, there's a video that uh, Harry Brewis did, um, uh, H. Bomber guy, did uh, about um, Phil Mason's approach to, to, to bed. It's actually about the Ghostbusters video, and we'll get back to that in a little while. But there's an interesting exchange with Eric Hovind. I find that really, really fascinating because um, Hovind, um, and you know it's interesting. There's there's uh, an interesting comparison to be drawn between going up against um, anti-far protesters and a quite violent, charged atmosphere, and going up against Eric Hovind. But um, it's interesting because Hovind asks him a question, which is, um, is it impossible for God to exist? To which your answer has to be no. And indeed, you know. Um, Dawkins himself says this, I don't know, chapter, whatever, verse, whatever, of the God delusion, that he's a level six um, uh, agnostic or level six atheist. I can't remember which way he puts it around, but it's basically a hyper agnostic. Um, you cannot say, you know, there's a very short, simple answer to that, which is no. Not it's mm -hmm. a malformed question. No, it's not. Of course, it's not impossible. So again, it's this jumping to conclusions. It's this pattern that, that repeats time and time again. And I'll say this again, if Phil wants to discuss this, I'm very, very happy and I've always been very happy to discuss this um, face to face on whatever forum he wants. Um, but what I would much prefer is to focus on the sexual dimorphism issue and let's write an exchange of views about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I think Christy. that that you know it would be a very good discussion because you know one can do science one can do science and not really carry those values over into the other parts of your life. You don't get credibility on everything you say just because you do um, science in one area of your life. You have to demonstrate your commitment to evidence-based conclusions consistently, yeah. and I don't Absolutely. see that consistency from him. And we're all, to a certain extent, greater or lesser extent, guilty of biases. We'll come back to this later on because I love this rational, skeptical thing that we're all individuals. Yes, we're all individuals. Um, everybody, everybody at some level is, um, uh, you know, is, is subject to certain biases. And the more people protest their individuality, uh, you know, it's interesting just how much they flag up their lack of individuality. But we'll 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 get back to that. Um, there's also the question of, of language, and you know that I don't debate enemies, I bury them. I think if we could 
agree on on you know if we were to ask a, an audience out there who would you select as the number one um arch enemy arch nemesis even of uh, a certain youtuber called thunderfoot i think we could all agree it's anita sarkeesian <laughs> Now, I don't know, it's an interesting thing here in terms of the language and the understanding of the language. Maybe, you know, there's, there's a willful misinterpretation, but maybe I'm being unfair. Maybe it is a lack of understanding because I don't quite know how Barry is being used in that context because Sarkeesian was nominated by, or named, listed by Time Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential people either last year or the, the year before. Yeah, I know it's mainstream media. I know it can be dismissed immediately. But <laughs> putting that to one side, it is... Interesting, isn't it? Just how you define buried in that context. Um, I can't think of many scientific thing, articles that talk about burying somebody else. No, no. It's <laughs> it's a shame because then it shows that really what it is about is about playing to an audience. It's about playing to the gallery, and it's not about that scientific debate. And the problem is, it's like, I can't remember exactly the Nietzsche quote, but about staring into the abyss. You get dragged down to that level. And I certainly got dragged down to that level, and that was was not good. We'll come back to that in the context of, of Kevin's video in a second. But um, it's uh, it's it's troublesome when 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 this happens. Um, the I, I, I really see there there are many parallels here between um, the way in which these debates are happening and sort of tabloid newspapers, what we used to call the gutter press, which was about, you know, character assassination, about really trying to pull people down. And, you know, it's it's a shame that somebody who could be such a really great um, advocate for science, and in many ways is, it's just a shame that his sort of legacy in some ways is going to be, this is the guy that was obsessed with Anita Sarkeesian. Because yeah. what he does... You know, it's it's you know he does he does some good science videos, um, but yeah, when you're sort yeah. of every fifth video is going to be about Anita Sarkeesian, or in the middle of a non in a something on a completely different topic, you bring her up. Yeah, yeah. it's like it's, his, the Joker um, to his Batman. You know, if he's Batman. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, one thing I would like to to clear. I'll get off the top topic of, of Phil Mason soon. Um, uh, very soon, um, because we, we've discussed him enough at this point. As I say, what I'd really like is to have this ex exchange of views that we could publish would be best. Um, but what I, it's interesting, he, he has made the claim. Um, so what I wanted from him was um, a, a profile, um, what's called a Google um, Scholar. Yeah, people are familiar with Google Scholar, but there's also... Um, and there's also something called ORCID. ORCID's very powerful in terms of an academic's profile. And um, it's uh, it would be very interesting to see that. I've asked Phil for that. He hasn't he hasn't provided that. Because he's made the claim um, that the research he's done has been his. And the exact claim he's made has been, I did this on my own without a group. And that's not how we do science. You know, it's we collaborate. I cannot find, you know, maybe that they exist out there. And if if they do exist, I hope Phil can send me the links. I can't find um, a single author paper by Phil, um, by Philip E. Mason. Um, he collaborates as we all do. This is how science is done. We collaborate in large groups. And this is not about, as he's claimed, some sort of dick measuring competition. He seems to he's dragged it very much down to the personal. And I can understand why in some aspects I've hardly been um, the most... Uh, how can I put it, level at times, and I've lost my temper, as I've said. Um, but all the same, to claim that all the research he's done, he's done without a research group, seems to me to be an extraordinary claim. And again, I'd like to see evidence for that. Um, what else? Yes, yeah. the, on the, the final thing. <laughs> just, yeah. I have got some notes here. I just wanted, there's just going to be this one off um, hangout, so I wanted to make sure I had my notes. Um, so he, if he seems to have got a little bit wound up by the fact that I've said that I'm a professor of physics a number of times. I've, you know, that's my job title. There's not much I can do about that. I know full well just how lucky I am, and luck is the operative word, to have the particular position I have. 
Um, and again, I stress, I'm speaking on behalf of myself here, not related to my employers at all. Um, but, you know, the, the point that I make to the students and the postdocs in the group, and I think this is an important point for others who are in, you know, doing PhDs or postdocing at the moment, um, is that I know for a fact that what I had in 97, which is when I got, got a lectureship, um, wouldn't even get me within sniffing distance of a short list now for a lectureship distance. The bar keeps going up and up and up and up and up. I happen to be in the right place at the right time. That's that's the only reason that that, that professor title is. The reason I um, included it in some of my emails to Phil was because in the context of what we were discussing in terms of admissions, gender balance and physics, I thought it was fairly relevant. Um, he seems to have taken it as a personal affront, which I find again intriguing in terms of the the psychological and sociological aspects of this. Um, but yeah, okay, the final thing. Okay, can I just jump in on that really quick? Yeah. Because I think that it's important to talk about the tactics that are often used to deflect from the real issues. And quite often what you can observe with, with Phil Mason is that he will become outraged about something unrelated to the topic at hand because he doesn't want to talk about the topic at hand. What he wants to do is move, basically, he, he wants to play the victim card. He wants everything to be about grievances that he has and wrongs and slights he's experienced. Because if he's the victim, then he's not, he's not being exposed for basically making unsupported claims, which I hold that his claims on sexual dimorphism and physics are completely unsupported, unscientific, and quite frankly, ridiculous claims. If you're saying that that's the thing that makes the determination, right? That's the most important causal factor. So but I think it's not. Um, it's so, sorry to put in, Chris. Go on. Sorry. Okay. Just yeah, but just to say that um, there there is a tactic that he uses and others use as well as a deflection uh, way, in sort of the same way that you know creationists would use deflection tactics in order to stop um, a conversation about, say, you know, the age of rocks or something else that they know they can't win on. So I think it's it's really deceptive because it's it's a way to avoid admitting you're wrong. Or admitting that you said something that you should, you know, you need to be corrected on and you need to retract. And yeah. people, even though that they claim they're led by the data and they're rational and they're evidence-based and logic, when it comes to actually correcting themselves when they make a mistake, I don't see it very often. No, it's, it's, the language again here is very, very important because you read a scientific paper or you read a good scientific paper and you'll find that the language is always couched in terms of possibly, tentatively, we suggest perhaps the evidence leads us to suspect, the evidence leads us to suggest, not this proves because there is no such thing as proof in science. I think that, that, that's, and that's not just a semantic thing. I come up against this time and time again. It's not just a semantic thing. As you, you've alluded to inductive versus deductive reasoning before, um, Carlo Ravelli has written a brilliant article. If I send you the link, Christy, can you put it down there? Um, of course. Um, has written a brilliant article about the, the key role of uncertainty in science. That, that sort of uncertainty and that level of, you, you have to be, as Feynman said, you have to be, um, you, you, you're uncertain, at, you're always uncertain at some level. You know, it's even at the level of a measurement. You know, what's the probability of measuring somebody as exactly, precisely six feet tall? What's the probability? Zero. Exactly, precisely, down to the infinitesimal precision level, it's precisely zero. So we have uncertainties, we have experimental uncertainties, we have error bars. Students are driven to distraction um, by error bars, physics students uh, in first year, by error bars and uncertainties and properly considering uncertainties. That type of uncertainty and that type of, well, this is the best we can do and the evidence we've got is entirely, entirely at odds with an in-group dynamic which says pawned, busted, destroyed, wrecked. Because it suggests that this is the definitive answer, this is the definitive position and we win. When in fact, that's not what science is about. And I, str I really recommend Ravelli's article. It's a fantastic piece of writing. He's written a really good book. Um, I can't remember the exact title, but it's like seven key ideas in physics. Really short book, like, I don't know, 50 pages, 60 pages. Really, really good writer. Has won a, a number of different awards. Um, so you have this strong 
cultural um, dichotomy between this, you know, YouTube, we win, we win, we pawn, we wrecked, we destroyed, we busted. And actually, what should be the much more humble, look, I don't really know, the evidence leads me to suggest in this direction, but in fact, there are all these confounding issues here, and I've got to roll that in. The best I can do on the basis of the evidence I've got at the moment is this. And so it's a very strong cultural difference, which is why this rational, skeptical um, trademark um, <laughs> community uh, is, is really makes me smile at times. Um, because the language they're using is not the language of science. You know, and the sheer ridiculousness of a community that claims that it's rational and skeptical and pro-science. Trump. It, it, the, the, that's that's a massive dichotomy in terms of that man if you look at what he said about science and his anti-science he's a man that the american physical science has just um society has described as anti-science so mm -hmm. you're rational and skeptical and you're voting for somebody or you're you're encouraging people to vote for somebody who's anti-science that's i don't know that's madness to me absolute madness